Well, I just want to thank Pastor Jason for the privilege of sharing God's word with you as we are here at our 10th week of watching church online. Can you believe it? I want to encourage you today as Paul encouraged the Corinthians to stand firm in the faith, to be courageous, and to remain strong. For the whole month of May, we are examining the importance of Christ-like character. When I was Around the age of 12, my parents gifted me this book. The book's title was The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Teens. Ambitious, right? And there was one question in that book that has stayed with me all these years. And the question was this, that if you had the chance to be at your funeral, to see who is there and to hear what they said about you, what would you want them to say? Because at every funeral that I've ever attended, what is so humbling is that people don't want to talk about your achievements, your earnings, or your credentials. They want to talk about your character. That is what people remember. That is what people celebrate. It is who we are. It is our God-given character. And so when we say we value character, this is what we mean. We say that character comes before gifting. Our character isn't value neutral. How we live, love, and lead matters. Gifting is good, purpose has its place, but Christ-like character always stands above. I have to admit, I am still finding it so strange to think that we are living in a time that for generations to come will be taught in schools and read in books. And there is one thing that is certain, that when we look back on the, on the past, hindsight will be twenty twenty. And I wonder what sort of conclusions will be drawn about who we are and what we did during this time. What did we do well? What did we not do so well? The truth is, is that who we are and what we do will be judged because that is what we as humans have always done. We look to the past in order to learn from the past. Economists will be judged for how well or how not well they restarted the economy. Government officials will be judged according to how well or how not well they led during a crisis. Health officials will be judged for what medicine or treatment they did or did not find, because hindsight is always 2020. But what about the church? What about you and I as followers of Christ? Will the church of tomorrow have anything to say about the church of today for how we navigated through this unprecedented moment? And the answer is yes. But what exactly the church of tomorrow may be looking for, it might surprise you. Because what they will be looking for will not be our programs, nor our technology. They won't really care much about our worship songs. But what they will be looking for is our character. Because a lot can change from generation to generation. But when each generation serves a God who is unchanging, who does not change, there should be one thing that should never never change from one generation to the next. And that is our Christ-like character, our spiritual fruit, our God-given perspective to when we experience circumstance and opposition. And when we look at the early church in the book of Acts, what we see is that they didn't do everything perfect. Their leaders made mistakes. In fact, when you read Paul's letters to the church, you see that you look at them and you think to yourself, man, they too have their issues. But what they had in which there is no criticism or critique is perspective. The perspective of counting all things that happen to them, good or bad, as joy. In fact, what we see when you read the book of Acts is that the more difficult the circumstance, the more intense the opposition, the more these early Christians were filled with joy. In Acts chapter 5, we see the apostles being dragged before the Jewish council. And there they are beaten and they are forbidden to speak the name of Jesus. But in Acts chapter 5, verse 41, we read, Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. You see, regardless of what happens in this season or the season to come, if we can follow Jesus with a perspective of joy through every circumstance, I promise you, the church of tomorrow will look back on this moment with great pride. Will we do everything perfect? Of course not. Will we make mistakes? You better believe it. But if we can gain the right perspective during this pandemic, we will never be without a reason to rejoice. The question that I want to ask you this morning is, do you have joy today? 
What are your reasons for rejoicing in the Lord? Go ahead and comment below. Let us know what reason do you have to rejoice in the Lord? Truthfully, it hasn't been the easiest season to always be filled with joy, has it? I'll be honest with you, I haven't always been the most joyful person to be around. And I can look right through that camera and I can actually see my wife nodding her head. Stop that. You know, we've had our days that have been pretty good. And we've had some days where at the end of the day, we sort of laugh to ourselves and we say, well, let's turn the page on this one and let's move on to the next. But through this, I believe God has been teaching us a very valuable lesson. And that lesson is how to have the right perspective. And that right perspective is to no longer confuse his joy with the world's happiness. Because there's a difference, right? There's a difference between God's joy and the world's happiness. Did you know that the word happy comes from the Latin word hap, which means one's luck? But the word joy comes from the Greek word kara, which means favor. That is because happiness is dependent upon your circumstances. You need a good and favorable circumstance in order to be happy. Joy, on the other hand, is not dependent on circumstance. It's dependent upon our salvation. And that is because joy is your spiritual inheritance in Christ. Meaning, if you had all the money in the world, you might be able to buy happiness, but you can't buy joy. Joy cannot be purchased nor bought. It can only be given. Joy is what the Bible describes as the fruit of God's spirit. You see, if we're the branch, as God's word says, and he is the vine, it means that as the branch, we are not capable of producing God's fruit on our own. It is only by God's spirit that we can, that our lives can, can produce the joy that, that God gives us. You see, Jesus never promised you and I happiness. He never promised his disciples that we would live a happy life. In fact, if there is anything that Jesus promised us, if there is anything he guaranteed, it's that we might experience the exact opposite. But what Jesus did do is that he asked the Father, that the Father might give you and I the full measure of the joy that Jesus had while he walked this earth. Think about that for a moment. The one who was sent to this earth to die, the one who suffered greatly on our behalf, He lived a life that was filled with joy. Yet at the same time, he didn't just live this life full of joy. He asked the Father that you and I might experience his same joy as well. And so if in this season today, you have found yourself lacking in joy, may I suggest to you today, it's not because you've lost joy, but perhaps you've been trying to find joy in all the wrong places. I want you to know you are so much more capable than you realize of living and having joy today. In you today is an inheritance in which no thief can kill, steal, nor destroy. My prayer for you today is that regardless of circumstance, your joy may begin to overflow. And that is why I want to share with you this morning an example of a man in Scripture who was able to have joy despite terrible circumstances and opposition. And that man's name was Paul. Now, if you are unfamiliar with this man, Paul, Paul is known as one of the greatest missionaries to ever walk this earth. Originally, Paul was one who heavily persecuted Christians. But because of God's grace, he had a a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, which led him to become a tremendous follower. And he was given this incredible task to take the gospel of Jesus and to carry it out of Jerusalem and to bring it to the ends of the earth. But Paul, while Paul would do mighty things for God during his life, one of the more underappreciated aspects of Paul's life was his character, especially during the difficult times. Paul was more often remembered for the things that he did rather than the man that he was. When we think about Paul, we remark at his intelligence. We look at his spiritual gifts. He had this unique ability to debate, and he was fearless even in the face of death. There's no question, Paul was a gifted man of God. But Paul was also a man formed by a deep Christ-like character. In fact, there is no other person, there is no other apostle in the Bible who would suffer as greatly as Paul would suffer. Yet Paul's life was marked by an unwavering joy. In fact, the more difficult the circumstance became, the greater his joy, the greater joy he had. 
Paul in, in many of his writings would describe his intense suffering as a light and momentary affliction compared to the more eternal glory that he would one day receive in the resurrection. Paul would speak about how he had learned in this life that whatever state he found himself in, that he learned how to rejoice in the Lord. At the very beginning of the book of Philippians, and if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. We see Paul in his introductory remarks right to the church in Philippi. And he says, as I write to you, I am praying for you with joy. Where exactly is Paul writing this letter to the Philippians? Well, Paul is in Rome, the destination that Paul considered to be his lifelong dream. Paul had a dream to one day be able to go to Rome and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in the greatest city on earth. Well, no wonder Paul is so joyful. I mean, wouldn't you be as much filled with joy if you were able to achieve your lifelong dream? Until you realize that Paul is not in Rome as a free man. Rather, Paul is in Rome as a prisoner. Paul is living under house arrest, and he is chained to a Roman soldier 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all day, every day, as he awaits his death sentence. Yet here is what Paul says to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12 to 14. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Paul has every reason to be angry, to be bitter, to be resentful. His lifelong dream of going to Rome has not turned out the way he has wanted it to go. But instead of being angry and bitter, Paul is filled with great joy. Why? Because God has given Paul a new perspective in which he can see his circumstance. Paul says, the reason that I suffer so greatly under these circumstances is for a heavenly purpose. And that purpose is for the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul gives two reasons why the gospel is advanced. The first is that the gospel is beginning to be preached and known throughout the imperial guard. You see, Paul was chained to a Roman soldier all day, every day. And this chain, it is said, was to be about 18 inches long. That's not very much room between Paul and that Roman soldier. There was nowhere he would go, nowhere he could lay his head, where he had not this soldier, this guard beside him at all times. I mean, Paul couldn't even go to the bathroom by himself. But here he is, Paul, in this home every day with this soldier. In fact, it's estimated that several dozen soldiers would have rotated through Paul's home on this guard. What might our perspective be if we were living under such circumstance? if we were living under house arrest, if we were chained to a soldier each and every day, no freedom, you can't go anywhere. In fact, what you're doing is you are waiting your time in order for your death sentence to come down. What might our circumstance, what might our attitude be under such circumstance? But here we says we don't know how, we don't know who, but we, all we know is that over time, some of these soldiers became to be known as followers of the way of Jesus. Because as they sat there, as they were chained to Paul, what might they have heard Paul say? What might they have seen Paul do? As the many people would have come into Paul's home, they would have heard Paul share the gospel. As Paul sat there writing his letters to the church, perhaps those, those soldiers asked, Paul, what are you writing about? Maybe late at night, as they lied there about to go to sleep, perhaps they had conversations about the greater meaning of things. Perhaps they looked at Paul's attitude his perspective, his joy as he awaited his sentence. So not only do we see that Paul witnessing to this imperial guard, we see the gospel of Jesus going to some of the, the most elite and privileged people in the city of Rome, but we see the church strengthened as well. Paul says that not only was the gospel going to the imperial guard, but we see that the church was being strengthened by his attitude and his perspective. Paul says that his perspective was giving the church the perspective they needed to be a witness as well. His joy, his confidence, despite his circumstance, had become their joy and their confidence as well. Everything about Paul's life was marked by one thing, that the gospel of Jesus Christ might advance. 
And as long as the gospel was advancing, well, it didn't really matter to Paul whether he was a free man or whether he was locked in chains. The advancement of the gospel was the perspective Paul needed to live his life filled with joy. And so the question that I want to ask you today, myself included, is this, that if we lost everything, if we lost everything, yet the gospel of Jesus advanced, would it be worth it? Would we still live our lives filled with joy? You see, the mission of the church, the sole purpose for our existence is for the advancement of the gospel. The reason why we gather, the reason why the church is called together is to be a witness. It is to be an example of who Christ is. But that word advance that Paul uses doesn't just mean any sort of advancement. That word advance in the original language has a specific meaning, and the meaning is this. It's not just any sort of progress or advancement. It's progress despite obstacles. It's progress despite opposition. Because resistance to the gospel is an unavoidable reality to being a follower of Christ. And many of us, myself included, in fact, I'm going to put myself at the very front of the line. I have to admit, my discipleship to Christ in my life has been pretty privileged. I've lived in this beautiful country. I've had wonderful opportunities. There has never been really that much true resistance to the gospel when it comes to my discipleship. Now, I know some of you have. Some of you have, especially some of you who've come from different parts of the world, have experienced true opposition, true resistance to being a follower of Christ. When I hear your stories and when I see your faith under trial, I think to myself and wonder, has my joy ever truly been tested? Has my inheritance ever been threatened? Has my perspective ever been challenged? Now, I hope that I can make it clear today that I am not trying to compare this current circumstance to to some of the other significant challenges followers of Christ have faced in our world, both past and present. But what if, what if in this moment, the gospel of Jesus Christ is being advanced? What would it be worth losing if it meant that others might know Christ? For Paul, the answer was everything. Paul would later go on to say in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, he says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Once again, Paul had the perspective needed. God enabled in Paul the perspective needed to see that what the enemy intends for evil, God can take it and he can turn it into good. And that is the perspective that can only lead to a life filled with joy. We don't have all the answers, do we, for what God is doing today. I mean, only God knows. And there will be a day down the road where the church of tomorrow will look back and they will have the answers. Remember, Hindsight is always 2020. But right now, I believe, my wholehearted belief is that God is doing something here today. He is giving his church a fresh perspective, a fresh new perspective, which will last for generations to come. To be truthful, it's not really a new perspective at all. Rather, what God is doing is he is making an old perspective and he is renewing it, making it new again. And that perspective is this, that God has poured out his spirit on his church. And where the spirit of the Lord is, the church will emerge with a new spirit of boldness, with a fresh fire and a newly anointed power. Where the spirit of the Lord is, the church will arise with a fresh new zeal for God, for his house, and for the world. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there the church will have unwavering character despite opposition and circumstance. And where the spirit of the Lord is, believers will be filled with the joy that even if you take everything else away, you cannot take away their joy. You have that joy living in you today. You are capable of having the perspective needed to walk by faith and not by sight. Joy is your spiritual inheritance, meaning you cannot buy it, you cannot purchase it. And if you cannot buy joy, it means that your joy cannot be taken away from you. 
Jesus has asked the Father to give you the full measure of his joy. And know today that every prayer that Jesus prays is a prayer answer because Jesus prays, there's no prayer that Jesus prays that is not prayed perfectly according to the will of the Father. Joy is the God-given character needed to step into the new normal and be the church who God is calling us to be. And so today, if you are lacking joy in any way, I want you to know something. God is not disappointed in you. You have not failed him in any way. But we need to stop and we need to ask the Holy Spirit if there are any ways today, if we have been looking for joy in all the wrong places, if we are lacking joy, we need to stop and consider that question. Have I been trying to find joy? Because truthfully, there is only one place in which you and I can find joy, and that is in God's presence. Psalm 1611 says, and I'm going to quote, John Davis, one of our wonderful elders and spiritual fathers, who says every time we gather in Canada for prayer, he prays this this psalm. Psalm 1611 says that in his presence is fullness of joy. And so if you are needing a fresh outpouring of God's joy on your life today, if you are needing a fresh new perspective in this season, I want you to pray with me today for a new perspective that can shift and be shaped into joy to pray for faith that in all circumstances, the gospel of Jesus Christ will advance. And to pray today that we can be still and know that when everything around us is full of turmoil, when everything around us seems shaken, that we can be still and know that what the enemy intends for evil, and trust me, the enemy does intend to use this season for evil, that God will turn it into something good. That is our reason for joy today. So would you pray with me right now? God, we thank you today so much for this time gathered on this Sunday morning. God, we recognize that we are not able to see with human eyes what you are doing. And so God, today we choose to see according to faith. God, give us eyes to see. Give us us the faith to know that God, that no matter what is happening in our world, that the gospel of Jesus Christ will advance you will build your church and even even Hades cannot come against it. Nothing will come against your gospel. And for that reason, oh God, I pray that you would give us a new perspective. Lord, shift our perspective to put our eyes on your joy, to take our eyes off of the world's happiness and to find true joy that comes only in you. God, we want to be a church that is made ready for the season. God, we want to be a witness And so, oh God, I pray, Lord, that you would just renew a right spirit in us, a right spirit that can count it all joy whenever we face trials. As Paul says, that we can just give thanks in all seasons, that we can can see that even when things don't go the way we want them to go, that God, you have a heavenly purpose. Lord, let us be filled with joy. God, as we step out into the new normal, as we step into the future of who you are calling us to be, I just pray, Lord, that there will be a resounding joy in every single person who is called by your name, who chooses to pick up their cross and to follow you. And so we just pray, God, that your name would be blessed. Lord, that your name would be known. God, I pray that you would blow even our own expectations for who you want to reach in this season. Lord, we trust in you. And we thank you so much for who you are and what you have done. We thank you for Jesus and the joy that he has asked, the Father that you might give to us. We receive your joy in Jesus' name. Amen.